Do you ever get some odd piece of tech that seems like it has a lot of promise and get completely disappointed by the software? Well, that's pretty much the story here of the Quumzy H3, the Stream Dock. Not to be confused with the Steam Deck or the Steam Deck Dock or the Stream Deck, but uh, pretty much does the same thing as the last one there. So anyway, if you want to see me play with this little thing, get it to display more than the shining baby sun here, then come along with me on this adventure. Here we got the box for the H3. It looks suspiciously like a Stream Deck that I have over there. Except it appears that the touch screen is the whole thing. I guess we'll see when we open it up. It's also got gigabit ethernet on the side. In the box we have the unit itself. The stream dock and hub that gets more stuff done. So this thing is kind of trying to be a stream deck, which I know is a specific thing, plus like a USB type C hub or docking station all in one. So on the end we have gigabit ethernet and a power button. On top we have two USB 3 type A ports and an HDMI output. So on the end here we have a type C, this goes to your laptop, and a PD port, this goes to your charger I believe. So it'll pass through USB type C power delivery back to your laptop. It'll take DisplayPort Alt mode I assume for the HDMI output. Bottom we have a full size and a micro SD card slot. These are running at USB 2 speeds according to the documentation. So I got my H3 stream dock plugged into my computer. It came with Windows and Mac software on a micro SD card, which is handy because it's a micro SD card reader. So you can just plug it in, SD card in. Let's take a look at what the software looks like. Some of you may know I actually own the real thing. I've been using this for a couple of years now to control OBS and also lights in my room and stuff like that. So this will make a good point of comparison. So I open these two side by side here and uh, can you tell me which is which? So this is the real one and this is the fake one. One thing to note is that this one has 15 buttons and this one only has 12. That's just because of the resolution of the screen. This one also has a funny mode called screensaver or gif mode. And if I click it to screensaver, you can see in real life it just shows an image. You can add a JPEG. It has to be exactly 480 by 320, so it's not terribly useful. If you click on gif mode, then you can upload your own gif. I've uploaded the sparkling baby sun here. And of course we have key mode, which is normal. You have multiple scenes, so it's a little bit different in the UI in that your scenes are on this side instead of up on top but uh, each of them can also have a key mode, a screen mode, but this doesn't seem to save. The software um, doesn't seem to remember when I put it in GIF mode, because I really wanted to have my scene one here be the sparkling baby sun. And then I've set this scene up so that it's tied to Discord, so that every time I go in Discord I get a sparkling baby sun, but in reality that doesn't happen. Every time you flip scenes and back, it goes back into key mode. Now one thing that is handy is that notice that these buttons look exactly the same and that's the Home Assistant plugin. So you can see I've got a button for my fan, the lights in my room, the lights in my closet. And it just loaded the Home Assistant plugin like no problem. So you click here on the App Store. Yeah, so there's the Home Assistant plugin. So the real one switched from having a very similar UI to this a couple years ago to having a website now. So if I search for stream uh, home assistant, it looks very similar. Got a little more information here. Some other quirks I've noticed, each of these buttons is an image. So both with the stream deck and the stream dock, there's a screen behind here and then the button faces press the touch screen. So there's some USB handshaking that goes on, and each time you press a button, it updates the image of that key. So if I press my lights button, you can see it shows off, and it shows... That's a problem. Fix the problem with my Z-Wave light switch. It's not a fault of these guys. We're not gonna turn those lights off anymore. So one thing I noticed is that sometimes, currently it's working just fine. So the state of this icon matches the state of the real world. So as I press it, it turns yellow, it turns gray. That's normal, that's how it's supposed to work. I did notice occasionally in testing, especially when I put my PC to sleep and woke it back up again, that the button images weren't updating. And I have no idea why, and it's kind of random when it happens. 
the real thing does not have this problem ever. But the buttons would still work, they just wouldn't update their faces, and I have no idea what to cause that. Another problem I've noticed is that my PC takes absolutely forever to boot up going through the post tests. So it's like a minute and a half before I actually get to log in. And this thing seems to like time out if it doesn't get initialized quick enough when you plug it in. So you plug it in, it has a little startup animation and sits there with a boot screen that just says clumsy. And eventually your computer comes up and it just gets stuck saying clumsy forever. But that was another quirk I've noticed with this. That was kind of really irritating because, I mean, aside from the fact that my PC takes a minute and a half to boot up, which is already really irritating, having some peripherals not come up is also very irritating. And so that is why the software is a huge disappointment. Being disappointed in the software, I decided it was time to take a look at Wireshark. Wireshark is our favorite Ethernet capture utility, but it can also capture and decode USB packets. So I'm going to use Wireshark to analyze the protocol this thing's using and see if I can do some basic reverse engineering. If I'm able to capture what's going on here, it would not be all that hard to write like a Python program to control this on your own if you want to do something much cooler than this app that's a clone of the Stream Deck. I had to get help from a USB protocol expert. He's an expert in plugging and unplugging USB cables, so I figured I could use his assistance today. So here's what a capture looks like. So the PCAP driver automatically inserted all of the configuration data at the beginning so that I didn't have to unplug and plug it back in. So this is not exactly real time. But then after that, we have HID data. So this shows up as a USB HID device. On my machine currently, it's device 2.2.2. Obviously that changes depending on where it is in your root tree. The H3 just seems to spam these low byte count packets over and over. And I have no idea what they are, but they don't matter because further down, we get some bigger packets. So here we go, the ones that start with 4.3. So if we look at what's actually in this packet, it has some text that says CRT mod 2. And so the mod 2 is switching it to mode 2. If you remember back here, we have screensaver, key mode, gif mode. That's mod 1, mod 2, mod 3. So this is actually a hardware setting in the firmware of the device, which one of these three modes you're in. And so it switches it to mode 2, so we're in key mode. Then it clears the screen with CLE. And then it does CRT bat. And what this appears to do is upload an image to one button. So then we get this JFIF. And if you look on the internet, JFIF is an old format of JPEG, kind of pre-EXIF. And it looks like they generated with Inkscape, which is kind of funny. So then we have more bytes. It's sent in a couple different packets. And so I just concatenated them all together. And I got this image. That image. And this is what that particular button looks like when it's initializing. It starts off with this grayed out home assistant. And once it's able to connect, it turns the right color. So this would make sense if it's initializing the plugin. And so we've, then we've got, so it's the end of the day, then we have another one. CRT bat, we have more JFIFs. And each of these starts with a CRT bat. And there's three bytes here, 0D, B104. And so that 04 is the key number. So the one we just looked at, we had mod 2, clear, and then we had 03. So that one, if you recall, was the fan, which is button 1, 2, 3. Now we're doing button 4, and then we're going to do button 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C. So we're going to do button 3, 4, 8, 9, and C. So here we've got button 4, it's another JFIF. Then we've got button 8. And the JFIF. And we've got nine. And button C. And each of them has an associated JFIF. And then at the end we have a stop. And I'm not sure what that does, but it's there. Then we have a bat on eight. So that must be updating eight after it changed correctly. That's kind of what initialization looks like. So here's another one where I press some buttons. So again, we have the configuration descriptors. We scroll down a bit. So here's a button press. So it says ACK OK. But then also in the binary data here, we have an 04. So that was button 4 that was pressed. And then that causes it to redraw the button because 
tenth of a second later, we get CRT bat 04 and then a J5 4 button 4. And then a stop. So then we have a CRT act again. This is button 4 again. CRT bat again. Again, we're going to get a J5 for 4. And we just keep doing this. Where's the next one? There's a stop. There's an ACK for button C. So now we're going to get a CRT for button C, and we're going to get the J5 for button C. So, protocol's not that complicated. Just like the original, actually, it's sending a JPEG for each individual key. So, the touchscreen controller is aware of the coordinates of each of those 12 keys, and when you touch one of those 12 positions, it sends a message to the computer saying, button 12 was pressed. It's not sending the coordinates on the screen, it's saying the button number. So you wouldn't be able to do just arbitrary touch screening with this, but you can make 12 touch zones and update their images separately. So this is very similar to how the protocol of the original worked. I actually looked into some Python libraries that do this, and it works very similarly. They have a different handshaking protocol, but the original Stream Deck was also encoding JPEGs of each button image on each button change. Yeah, so this is definitely relatively hackable if you want to play with this. So now that he reviewed the USB protocol, let's take a look at the hardware itself. Is the hardware actually decent for the price? So you could rub your head at it and find out here. What do you think? Is it worthy? So I think the hardware is actually not bad. It feels relatively robust in my hands. It doesn't feel like cheap plastic, even though it probably is, I don't know. The kickstand is not janky on my original model. The kickstand is a separate part that falls off every time you try to move it. So there's the kickstand. Here's the thing. Why are they separate? So yeah, I mean, I tried plugging my laptop into it with power pass-through. I got USB power delivery pass-through just fine. I tried the SD card and the micro SD card reader. They work just fine. They are USB 2. I wish they were USB 3, but they do work. Gigabit Ethernet is USB 3, so it is gigabit. HDMI, USBs, they work. I mean, what else to say? One quirk I found that he didn't notice is that when you put an SD card in, so here's an SD card for one of my cameras, it sticks out the bottom. <laughs> so I don't know if you can see this, but it sticks out the bottom, and then when you set it down, you're kind of setting it down on the SD card, which is like kind of jank. Um, it would have been nice if the SD card slots were on top, and honestly, maybe that would have meant cutting some features, but I would have been perfectly happy to cut like the HDMI port or something like that, that I would never use, because this on my desk would be much more useful to me as a USB hub and a SD reader than an HDMI dock. That's just me. So those are my thoughts on the hardware. Everything does work fine. It does feel good in the hands, it has some weird ergonomic quirks with the micro SD slot, and that's pretty much it. Also, that boot up bug I mentioned earlier, how it doesn't come up after rebooting the system or coming out of Hibernate, that's a software side problem on Windows. That's not a problem with the hardware itself. If I just open the app manually, everything shows up fine. So that's their Windows driver, not correctly identifying a device that's already been enumerated. It's probably waiting for new device plugs or something like that. But that seems to be what the issue is there. So if you write your own software, there won't be a problem. So my expert abandoned me, but what do I think about the Clumsy H3 overall, the Stream Dock? The hardware is relatively solid. The cost of this is a lot less than the original, which I also have. It functions just fine, but the Windows software is like a complete mess. If you were planning on writing your own software anyway, this is cheaper than the original and does all the same things. If you otherwise have a use for some of these ports on it, I don't know, maybe you'll like it too. I think this is cool as a tinker toy. I don't know if I would want to rely on it, but eh, those are my thoughts. So feel free to uh, message me on Discord if you have any questions. If you want the PCAP files that I made, I'm going to make a link down below to my blog. I'm going to upload those PCAP files from Wireshark. If you want to try to debug this on your own. Any questions, Discord server down below. I also have a Ko-fi where you can tip me if you'd like. And as always, I'll see you guys on the next adventure.